Thank you. Now, remember in the act of oblation, before entering in the simplification of the act of oblation, I would like to underline uh, something uh, that I haven't done, but plenty of things I haven't done, you know. Uh, it's um, an expression that Therese uses. I want to sh remind you the origin of uh, this uh, expression. In the act of oblation, Therese says, so you have the act, uh, hopefully, uh, e e or you remember it, uh, in order to live in one single act, you know, the bold, the beginning of the bold area, the last two paragraphs of the act, not the presentation of the act, the act itself. In, uh, in order to live in one single act of perfect love. Do you follow me? If you take in parallel to this, the stanza 8, put the two texts beside. Stanza 8, the third from the bottom, she says, the third line from the bottom, she says, would like to make an act of pure soul. Mm? On leaving this life, my exiled soul would like to make an act of pure love. Pure, perfect. It's okay. Same here and there. In the act, it's perfect. In this text, it's pure. From where comes the expression pure act of pure love? Is it the only, are these the only mentions of it? No. In manuscript C, Therese comes back to the same concept and even asks herself, do I have that purity or that act of pure love? Of course she has it, but she, 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 she's asking at a certain point. And when she quotes this expression, few lines before, she tells us from where she found it. She is in fact quoting a book from St. John of the Cross. Remember that she read the first time in her life St. John of the Cross. Not all St. John of the Cross, please be careful. Many people don't, do, don't know that, but it's important to know it because for specialists, it could be a, an eye-opener for something very interesting. So St. John of the Cross wrote four main books. St. John of the Cross is, uh, uh, takes part in the reformation of the Carmelite order with Therese of Avila, three centuries before Therese, in the 18th 16th century, no? uh, 1500s. He writes, he wrote four main books that we have, a couple of books that work together, The Ascent of Mount Carmel, and The Dark Night of the Spirit, uh, the, night, the Dark Night, sorry, Dark Night, then you have two other books. These go together in his eyes. St. John of the Cross, San Juan de la Cruz. Then the spiritual canticle and the living flame. What Therese reads is only the last two. Because she had two volumes, the, 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 the edition she was reading from had two volumes at least, I think. And she had only the volume, she read only the volume, Spiritual Canticle and Living, and Living Flame. This is why she will consider St. John of the Cross the doctor of love. The doctor, the teacher, the master who teaches how to love. We are talking, of course, spiritual life. So, the interesting thing, but this is a parenthesis, is that she didn't, she never read, she never had direct access, maybe some quotes, but never direct access. People from the quotes deduced that she read The Ascent of Mount Carmel and Dark Knight. No, she didn't. 
This is very important. Because she will undergo the dark night, this is uh, the parenthesis, to finish the parenthesis, she undergoes the dark night in, uh, before 92, she finishes it, it's finished by the end of 92, without reading John of the Cross. And she is the greatest saint and she offers her way to everybody. So this means what? That the dark night of John of the Cross is for everybody, against some, what some great theologians had said in the last century. Now, close parenthesis. I don't want you to be busy with that. I want you please to focus here. So she reads, the first time she reads John of the Cross, she reads him at the age of 17, inside of the Carmelite monastery. She enters at the age of 15, remember with the permission, because normally you wouldn't enter at that age. Because you can only make your vows when you are, uh, uh, how we say it in English? Uh, of, age. of age. So, if 15, if you, one, one year after, you, you're not of age yet. Now, in the spiritual canticle, the version she was reading is spiritual canticle B. Sorry for the technical details, but for the specialist who might be watching later the, the video, they need to know that. So she was reading Spiritual Canticle B. And in the B version, there are differences between the B versions and the A. The B version has for each stanza an introduction. Allegedly, they're both from John of the Cross, so we're not questioning that or discussing it right now, but what I'm explaining from where she reads it. So she reads, in the introduction of stanza 29, an explanation on pure love and the importance of pure love, the purity of love. So it's not just to love, but to love purely, with purity. You see what, what we are we're trying to say here? So John of the Cross says, in the beginning, in the introduction of stanza 29, he says that he is talking about uh, the spiritual state of the soul at that level, so we are uh, I think beyond spiritual marriage at that junction. He says that we shouldn't disturb the prayer of the soul. He talks about Mary Magdalene because according to the tradition Mary Magdalene with her sister Martha, with her brother Lazarus left the, the Holy Land and went to the south of France. There is a great tradition even in the Middle Age very developed uh, pilgrimage to Mary Magdalene uh, place at Saint Maximin and La Saint Baume, La Saint Baume, uh, one of the it was I think the third pil pilgrimage at that time in the Middle Age time after Saint Peter and after Saint John of Com uh, uh, Compostela, uh, Santiago of Compostela. Of course, Jerusalem wasn't always uh, available. So John of the Cross quotes Mary Magdalene because Mary Magdalene spent her the rest of her life as a hermit. She worked a little bit, she served, but then she went and finished her life as a hermit. So he is in a way saying that we need to defend the hermits. So people who don't necessarily do something, are not doing necessarily something, but are still very valuable in the eyes of God. What makes them valuable? He moves them to the purity of love. This is why he is defending John of the Cross, defending the souls who reach that quality or who wants to reach that quality because he says it's the purity of the act of love that makes the church go ahead and grow. Because the objection is, well, you are not doing anything. As a hermit, you don't do a great deal. If you look at preaching, uh, teaching, uh, helping the poor, uh, uh, helping the sick, uh, etc. The hermit is, is, is somewhere, we don't even know where, and then and, and he's alone or she's alone and, 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 and that's it. So the objection is big, it's like, what are the, where are the acts? So John of the Cross says, it's not the act in itself, it's the quality of the act that determines its 
uh, fecundity or its fruitfulness for the church. And at that moment, we are still in introduction of stanza 29, he says, one act of pure love is worth all the other works for the good of the church. One act on one side of the balance, the, the scale, it weighs more than all the other works done without, without that quality of, of act. So when Therese reads that, or any person reads that, it, it's, it's a powerful passage, this uh, uh, 29, no, introduction to 29, this small defense of the advanced persons who seem not to do a great deal. Hmm? Nuns, for instance, what do they do? Carmelite nuns, what do they do? Nothing. Nothing. They don't do anything. They don't teach catechesis, they don't preach, they don't write, they don't talk, they don't do anything. Zero. This is what Teresa of Avila conceived. Zero. No contact with the world of apostolate, of ministry. You have a contact. If you want to visit them, you can visit them, but <laughs> it will be very short. Hmm? <laughs> you see what I'm trying to say? So John of the Cross is addressing the issue, and Therese takes that issue on board because Therese is, an, is a Carmelite nun. And not only that, she will die at 24, and she, knows, she feels that she will die. So it's like nothing and useless. I'm dying young, and I'm not doing anything. And the world is complaining. All these nuns who don't do anything. You understand? So when she talks about pure love, all these things come to her mind, and she mentions it. We, we know that it comes from there because she talks about it in the text. It's important to understand what she's aiming for. So, in the act of oblation, what is she aiming for? A quality, a fruitfulness, a fecundity. Please, I beg you to read manuscript. There are some passages in the book, but you need to read the entire thing. It's not big, it's very small. It's a letter, a long letter, but it's a letter. She says, I want to preach. I want to die martyr. I want all types of martyrdom. I want to go everywhere and be a missionary in the end of the, to the end of the earth. Remember, at that time we still had China, we still have China, by the way, eh? um, Africa and, and other places. We, 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 we want to uh, make the, the entire world uh, Christian, no? And to know Jesus. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. But then, how can I achieve all that, she says. She says, God gave me my place. In the heart of the church, I will be, what? Love. The love. And you may add the pure love. Not any love. In the heart of the church. So, I, ha want, I feel the desires of all these missions, the, all these um, ministries. I want to preach the gospel till the end of the time. It's crazy what she says in this manuscript, no? I want all types of martyrdom because one type will not be enough for me. You know, burned or, uh, or trans transpierced or, you know, all the sort of, uh, uh, of martyrdom. She said, I want all the types of martyrdom. I need to, and all this, what am I supposed to do with all these desires? And I searched, I searched, and God gave me the answer. And she quotes St. Paul to the Corinthians, no? I discovered that the church has a heart, and that heart was burning of love. Okay? And I finally found my place. So, the, is this only something that belongs to Therese because she is a Carmelite nun? That's a temptation to say, well, the heart of the church means maybe the monastery. No, be careful. Be careful. It, it could mean something else. The vocation is for everybody. It's 
an invitation for all of us to, be, to reach the heart of the church, that burning furnace, and to be inflamed and transformed by this fire. Why? Because we want to reach that quality of love St. John of the Cross is talking about. Because only that quality has a ripple effect, a good ripple effect on the church. It is a powerful statement, remember. One single act of pure love is worth all the other acts that can, could be produced for the church. So, of course, if you, if you face such a statement, and he's a doctor of the church, you can trust him uh, in that, and he explains why and, and how, and she does as well. Well, then, then you want that love. So when she says the heart of the church is not the monastery, the heart of the church is something different. It's just entering deeper in God, entering deeper in the mystery of the church. And we are all invited to reach the heart of the church. You see what I'm trying to say? So the, the heart of the church here is not like an organ. Like the church is a body and the body has different organs. So I am, uh, uh, somebody is a priest, uh, um, somebody is a monk, uh, somebody is a preacher, somebody is a catechist, somebody is a mother, somebody is a father. You see what I'm trying to say? You have the different functions in the church. No, the heart of the church is not a function here. It's a central thing that belongs to everybody. So we need to be careful because this could be a misinterpretation of the image she uses um, um, we might be following St. Paul, by the way, who, who, who aims for that uh, in his letter, but that's not uh, Therese's uh, purpose. Now, Therese says in her act of oblation, in the second paragraph, I want, uh, the midst of the second paragraph, uh, I want, O oh my beloved, the, the sentence, the line starts with love, but then the sentence starts just a word after it. I want, O oh my beloved. Do you see that? Hmm? Second paragraph of the act itself. I want, O oh my beloved. So three lines from the end of it. I want, O oh my beloved, at each beat of my heart to renew this offering to you an infinite number of times. As we said the other day. Therese is not aiming for one single act. I've done my act, I've done my consecration, I'm fine. So it's like I entered in a state and now I'm locked into that state and I'm fine. No. Here lies a difference to a certain extent between our normal understanding of different acts of consecration and Therese's understanding of the act of oblation. An act of consecration, you can make it once, renew it from time to time, and that's it, you are fine. You are allegedly, uh, well, truly, consecrated too. I uh, did my act of consecration to the Sacred Heart, I did my act of consecration to Our Lady, etc. I took time and prepared, etc. I've done it now, I am consecrated, you see? So in your mind you say, I am consecrated. For Therese, no, it doesn't work this way. The act of oblation is not something you've done 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and now you are okay. No, it is something that should become uh, alive, beating with the heartbeat, renewed with the heartbeat. Do you understand? So now, all of us, we are, and she first, are facing a big problem, which is what? How can I repeat two still long paragraphs at every beat of our heart. How can the act of oblation, in other words, become alive in us? That's a theological problem. How? So Therese is facing that problem and is facing as well, and please remember, I'm opening now a s another s topic in the act of oblation, which is the intentionality, the intention of the act of oblation. So, first question, first difficulty is how can I make it repeatable and simplified? Keep that in your mind and wait a little bit. Now, the other question is
because they are combined in the mind of Therese, so I have to address them apparently separately, and then you will see how they will be unified by God's guidance uh, through Therese. Okay? So we have one issue to address, to a problem to solve, how to make it repeatable at each beat of my heart, how can it become a living prayer in me, a living oblation. Mm? Now, uh, the other question is, what about other people? Is this act involving me only, or like it is my prayer, it is my connection and relationship with God, or does it involve other people? So, here I would like to underline and open your eyes towards something that is not necessarily visible. And I have to confess that even myself, I remained for many years not seeing that dimension in the act of oblation which is the apostolic dimension, the missionary dimension of the act of oblation. Therese, when she makes the act of oblation, is not only thinking of herself. Therese is, I would almost, almost, no? It's a way to, to talk, no? To speak. I would almost say that the first intention of the act of oblation is missionary, is apostolic is worrying in a healthy way for the salvation of the souls of other people. Remember, Therese enters in the Carmelite uh, monastery to save many souls and more specifically priests' souls. This is the life of a Carmelite as St. Therese of Avila shaped it. If you read the, fir the first and third chapter of the Way of Perfection of Therese of Avila, you will see how she sets the goal to the nuns. She considers them like soldiers in an army, and she says you have to fight. And you have to fight for whom? You have to fight for the leaders. And the leaders, when she uses the word, means the priests. So you enter in the monastery, so the church for her is, is really militant, no? when we use the word militant church, no? For her, the church is really militant in the sense that we are, we are, uh, how would you say it in English? We are, uh, we have a job. We know, we have a job here. We are on a mission. Hmm? Uh, we are on a mission constantly. So the priests are the front guys. They are on the front, in the middle of the battle. And you have the rear part of the battle. And the rear part, in the eyes of St. Teresa of Avila, is the Carmelite nuns. So, any young girl, young or less young uh, girl who enters in the Carmelite monastery, at a certain point in her life, before reaching that point, God explains to her, shows to her that in fact the main reason why she enters is not just to think of her own salvation, but it's uh, much more than that. It's to think of the salvation of the priests. Souls, but it's easier priests, because one priest is multiple, you know, how many souls for each priest, no? How many souls are linked to one priest? So if you, if you pray for one priest, then you pray, obviously, for the, I don't know, 100,000 or, or more for, for the priest. So, so this is the mindset of a Carmelite nun, and Therese is a Carmelite nun. Now, so you need to understand that for Therese, the central motivation for her is the salvation of the souls. Of course, she works for herself, for her own perfection, as any, any person would do. But the goal is salvation of the priests. Their, their spiritual life. So, now, let us go back a day before the act of oblation, probably. We're not 100% sure, but it's a serious reckoning. Remember what happened. Therese was hearing in the refectory, because when you eat, you, you hear you listen, sorry, you listen to a reading. If you are a Carmelite nun, uh, of course, exceptionally, you, you might be in total silence, but usually you have somebody who reads. So that's a very interesting moment because you learn a lot. You read many books, by the way, uh, by just eating. So it's very beneficial, by the way, uh, of course, you, you, depending on the choice of the books. So, so many books go through your entire life. You, 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 the entire lifespan, entire lifespan of who have read already many books. So it's very interesting because you eat and you, and you listen. You listen. Now, 
Remember, she, ha she listened to the uh, act of oblation, the story of the letter, this letter circular of the Carmel de Luçon, uh, where the, uh, uh, they were saying, saying the story of this uh, Carmelite nun who offered herself to the justice of the Lord. Yes or, yes or not? Do you remember that? Now, when you offer yourself to the justice of God, you offer it for whom? For yourself, for your own sanctification, or for another cause? Another cause. The act of oblation is Therese's answer to that same cause. She starts the act of oblation saying what? I desire to love you, first line, top, act of oblation. Oh my God, most blessed Trinity, I desire to love you and make you loved. Make you loved what? Mean what? means what? Salvation of the souls. And the missionary dimension of the act of oblation. It's not a personal thing. It's not a private prayer. It's something for the church. You understand? It's not only for me. Uh, when you you, the holier you become, the, the more powerful uh, influence you have on the church. But here, we need to remember I think, I, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that, that the main purpose of the act, paradoxically, 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 is the salvation of the souls and God giving Therese a way, a means, to save more souls. To reach, remember, the pure act of, of love. Where is it mentioned? In the act itself, in order to live. So, she read John of the Cross saying that one act uh, of pure love is more powerful and beneficial and fruitful for the church, she hears that nun saying, I'm offering myself as a victim for the church, for all the bad deeds that were done. You understand that we are here on a missionary dimension. We are not on a spiritually, uh, a sp spiritual uh, prayer life uh, dimension, personal, individual. No, we are on, on a church time. Our dimension here is the world, the church and the world. Do you see that? So when Therese will, is, uh, when God explains to Therese how to reach that point through all what we've seen before, in fact, it's to reach what? To reach more efficiency, more, 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 more effectiveness, more results, more fruits, if you prefer, for the church. So we are in a complete missionary state. When you offer yourself uh, to the, the act of oblation, to the merciful love of God, you enter in a complete missionary state. It's not only about you. It's about you and all your children, your spiritual children. You see what I'm trying to say? So, now, to advance, uh, to walk a little bit more, Therese will receive, toward the end of her life, different responsibilities. First, she had the responsibility of the novices. She didn't have the title of mistress of novices, but she had the, the full task and the full trust of the priors. So she's mistress of novices, and trust me, it wasn't an easy thing. Not for her, for them, for the novices. Because it shows her soul. She's very faithful to God. She's very faithful to God. She receives as well the responsibility to pray, and this is a common thing at the in the Carmelite uh, order, Carmelite nuns, a responsibility to pray for two specific priests. It is very common amongst the nuns that they take, on, uh, they take the responsibility to pray for a specific priest. So two missionaries, uh, one I think went to Asia, the other one I don't remember now, uh, L'Abbé Roulon and L'Abbé Bélière, uh, two priests, uh, missionaries, um, asked formally, the Carmelite, they wrote to the prioress, asking for a nun to dedicate her prayers for, for them and for their missionary work. So, Thérèse, through the prioress, is entrusted to priests, uh, Father Bélière and Father Roulon. You need to read the letters of Therese to each one of them. Beautiful, beautiful. 
it's not a mission when she writes, but it's just uh, to make sure that uh, I'm praying for you, that's it. But it was an opportunity as well for Therese to express her doctrine, her little doctrine, okay? <coughs> her understanding of all what, you are, all, all what you are addressing right now, the weakness, the love of God, how things work, etc., all that, that thing. Hmm? Now, <coughs> Therese finds her task overwhelming. That's very interesting. To take care of her novices, of each soul, she says that's a huge work. Because a soul is, an immen is immense. No, we are immense. We are not just one or two things. So to catch and notice all the details and the difficulties and the needs of each person is overwhelming. And to pray. This is what she says. I have to pray for all my novices and I have to pray for all the priests. But in order to mention in detail all the needs of the priests and all the details of my little novices, uh, this will take me uh, more than uh, t uh, 24 hours. So there must be a solution for that problem. So what I'm about to explain, you can find it. Uh, the, the quotes are in the book, but you can, if you don't have the book or you, don't, you want to read Therese uh, just from her book, The Story of the Soul, you can read toward the end of manuscript C, which is the end of the story of the soul. Okay? There are two moments, th three moments, three moments, uh, one and then two very close to each other, separated by uh, some uh, parentheses of, of some sort, where Therese will address the simplification of the act of oblation. So, we will see how her prayer will become, as she said, following the, the beat of her heart or the breath. She will say, God gave me, God gave me a way to take care of all the souls. The praying for the two priests, praying for the, I don't know, I don't remember now how many novices she had, four, four or five. I'm saying a figure. Okay. Um, he explained to me, I am um, quoting her but changing a little bit for, uh, in order for us to understand. Hmm? She doesn't say explain, but she said God sh gave me a prayer. And this prayer comes from, is in fact a quote from the Song of Songs uh, of Solomon. It's a book from the Old Testament, a very dear book for the Carmelite nuns. Uh, remember this as well, that um, it is often very much meditated by the Carmelite nuns. Uh, the Song of Songs, you have only, I think, eight chapters, not more. It's a very sh small book, um, telling the story of love between, uh, of course, today, as Christians, we see it, the love between Jesus and each one of us. There are various interpretations, of course, from that book. Uh, you have uh, the Old Testament uh, Jewish interpretation, which is God and Israel. So God loves his people. His people is a community, so it's like female and he's male. So it's the story of that love. This is the Jewish, even till today, interpretation of the uh, Song of Songs. But then you have uh, the Christian uh, reading of it. Remember, God opens our eyes so we could read find Jesus in the Old Testament and read the Old Testament with the presence of Jesus in it. And uh, the church from day one understood that book in different levels, but they are all fine. The first level is considering the church. So it's this love between Jesus and the church. The second, uh, not in a specific order. I say first, second is not, it's not a specific order. You can take any order you want. The second possible interpretation is, they are all in this aligned. The second possible interpretation is between the human being and uh, the soul, uh, Jesus and the soul. Jesus and the soul. So it's not the church, could be, could be a soul. And as well, one of the most beautiful ones is between Jesus and Mary. This is the most, the deepest one uh, in a way, okay? Now, close parenthesis of what is this book. So there is a quote from that book that the Lord 
shows to Therese and explains to Therese, and the quote is, draw me and we will run. The, the bride, in the Song of Songs of Solomon, says to the groom, draw me, attract me, and we will run. It's a plural. So Therese says that this is how God is teaching her to pray. Read that. God is teaching me how to simplify my act of oblation. Okay? Because what is to pray? It's her act of oblation. So, God is showing Therese how to live the act of oblation in a shorter way. Draw me and we will run is way shorter than these two paragraphs. I'm sure you will agree with that. Uh, I could play a little bit cheeky and say it even goes with your breath. In and out, breathing in, breathing out. If we take how the uh, Eastern churches, uh, Eastern tradition of the Jesus prayer works, no? You say part of the sentence and the second part, breathing in, breathing out, gently. So it's fantastic. Hmm? You can take it as well as People call the word mantra. I don't like the word mantra. I prefer to say prayer. Huh? I'm sorry, I'm not a Buddhist or, or a Hinduist. I'm, I'm Christian. So it's a word, it's a prayer that you pray, that you say to the Lord. It expresses your desire, your, the deep action of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Draw me means attract me, she explains it, to the fire of your love. Which means what? The entire act of oblation is done. <coughs> So instead of repeating the entire act of oblation, you just say, draw me. Isn't that a genius simplification? You don't have, you said it, you understood it, you studied it, you followed the explanation, etc. Fine. Then you say it, you pray it. We did it the other day. And then what? How can you repeat it? You just say, draw me. Means you read the two par long paragraphs. Draw me. Which means, she explains, Attract me, throw me, cast me, cast me, in the fire of your love. This is the prayer. Now, she explains the rest. And we will run. And we will run. She says, it's a plural. She noticed, because you say, draw me. It should, it, it should then be, and I will run. No, and we will run. She says, oh. This is because God links us, or links various souls. Remember, she has a responsibility of various souls. The novices, the two priests. And this is the initial question. How can I pray for them? Will I then make a list of all their needs? Sister Marie uh, of the Assumption. So she needs, uh, oh yeah, she's not very good in, uh, uh, in cleaning, uh, she's not very observant, she's not very recollected when she works. Uh, she speaks sometimes and she, you know, as a Camelot during the day, you are, you are silent. Uh, uh, she, uh, this, 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 and the list. Is exactly. And this is your prayer, the prayer of the mistress of novices for her novice, for her little spiritual child. Then, this is only Sister Marie of the Assomption. No, we, now we need uh, Sister uh, Marie of the Trinité. Uh, so, of the Trinity. So, it, the list comes back. And then Father X and, and Father Y, uh, they ask me to pray for this, 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 this and that. <sighs> there are people who do that. This is why it is useful to learn from the great masters of spiritual life how to pray and to be uh, fruitful, efficient, and, and not consider as having lost or dropped or forgot about other people. So she says, you do not forgot, forget about them because it's God who linked them to you. And they will be attracted and they will run because you are running. So the closer, her logic here is very interesting, but this is, this is inspired by God. You can read the text. I, I, I won't read it, because if I read it, it will be uh, 12, uh, 12.30 and, and we don't have time. So, 
the more we are transformed into the fire of God, the more our power becomes the fire itself, not us. So it's the fire of God who will then flow, attract, make them run. No, we will run. The, all the souls whom God attracts and uh, attach to us. <coughs> now, you might ask me, but what is this business of souls? Do I have souls? Am I responsible of souls? No, each one of us here present, we are not uh, a nun, or you might be, I don't know, hidden, but uh, do I have souls? Are you responsible of souls? You might say, my family. You might say, I don't know, my dear friends. You might say, my parish, my community, the people I know. And what about the Chinese? Are you thinking about the Chinese? Uh, the list is long. I mentioned the Chinese, but I can mention the Japanese. There are many knees. What about them? Do you have children? Or, ah oh, yes, I have three children, or two children, or one children, or five, or ten. Ah, oh, good, big Catholic uh, 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 families, no? Are these all your children? This is all your life? Come on, wake up. You have thousands. Why? That, here is the question now. The, here is a theological question. I, I, I gave the quote here. I give the quote here in the book that supports that. It is called baptismal priesthood. Therese will not explain that. It's my job as a as a theologian to explain it. She can't do everything. She's a nun. She doesn't. She have other things to do. But my job is to explain that. So the the church explains from day one with Saint Peter. It says, because we are baptized in Jesus, who is prophet, priest, and king, because we are baptized, which means immersed in him, we become like him. So like him, as him, we are as well prophets, meant to listen to the word of God and proclaim the word of God. We are as well priests, not priests celebrating mass and confessing, no, but priests in which sense? Interceding for others. St. John Chrysostom says that the father and the mother at home, they are priests of their children because they offer to God their own children on the altar of their prayer. Wow! Thank you. John Chrysostom, 6th century by the way. So, it's ancient. Hmm? It's not ancient, it's still alive. They are with us. Okay? So, this baptismal priesthood, I won't talk about the uh, king, I'm, I'm focusing now on priesthood. What is this baptismal priesthood? Each one of us, because we are baptized, is supposed to have spiritual children. You are priest of people. You don't know them. You, don't, you might meet some of them, like the tip of the iceberg. So you know the tip of the iceberg of your children, yes. First and foremost, the members of your family or the, your, your own children, no? to start with. But then after that, you have all the hidden part of the iceberg. They are your children. You are supposed to take care of them. You are not just, uh, oh, I want to be holy, I am holy now, and I'm, I don't care about the rest of the world, no? We, 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 we turn that page from ages, no? We turn that page. So, you have a responsibility. Each one of your, uh, each one of my acts is one of your acts, has a direct impact on them. This is why Therese says, I need to be more united to Jesus. And the more, look at the paradox. People say, oh, these nuns, they don't do anything. Well, I'm sorry, they might be doing more than all the priests of the diocese. In the eyes of God, not in, my, not in our eyes. So, the more I am united to Jesus, the more souls are drawn to me. Am I, have, am I having a fixed number of souls? No, the, soul, the number can grow. I remember vaguely, I never f was able to find it, and I'm uh, almost finishing now, uh, a quote from Teresa of Avila. Teresa of Avila one day was, you know, she had some difficulties and struggles, etc. She suffered for something, uh, something, a trial, a difficulty in daily life. And then she turns in her prayer to the Lord and says, okay, how many souls do you give me for that? Do you give me, I don't remember now, the, I'm sorry, it's a very old thing that remained in my mind. I, would never, I was never able to find it again, but I read it, so it's, I'm not inventing it. So she, say, she, she, she throws a figure. 
like, I don't know, a thousand souls or 10,000 souls. And Jesus times it by 10. Jesus replies, you know, she had a dialogue, conversation with Jesus. So Jesus replies to her and says, no, not 10,000, 100,000 or a million or something. No, uh, multiplying the figure by 10 or something. So it means what? You gained more. You had a number, but the closer you draw to Jesus, the closer you are united to Jesus, the more powerful you are of, on the church and the world. You attract more. Nobody sees it. Nobody sees it. Nobody sees that. You can't say, oh, you can't walk in the street and say, oh, <laughs> oh, I have, I have, I have a hundred thousand, you know, and you, how many do you have? No, you don't do that. You don't, you don't know it. You live in faith. You live in faith. You live in faith. Okay? So, the simplification will continue. She won't, she's, in the second explanation she gives, so you are almost two pages before the end of the story of the soul, she says, I want to add something more to the explanations. I think I haven't explained it uh, totally right. And she adds something. And she says, and when she explains her prayer at that junction, she doesn't even mention the second part, which is, and we will run. She says, just draw me. And then, in, a, in another place, she says, it becomes like a sigh. Draw me. This is an act of love. Is it? Yes. You see? So, from a grace she received, a presentation of the text she understood, uh, the, of the grace she, understood, she got, a long paragraph of expressing it, we move on to being, you know, becoming aware of the, etc. Draw me, we will run. It becomes draw me and it becomes your desire. It's an inner act. It's more subtle. You see what I'm trying to say? So you see how the act of oblation becomes my normal breath, my prayer. So please never hesitate to insert that dimension, the entire dimension of these uh, four hours we spent, two hours uh, last Wednesday and, and two hours now, the richness of that act, please remember to add it in your prayer. It's not either or, you can continue, you may absolutely continue to do all your prayers as they are, but please add this dimension to a prayer, because otherwise it becomes mechanical. It doesn't become alive, you see? So hence, the necessity to spend time in silence, praying the act of oblation, repeating it, uh, adoration time, Mental prayer, contemplative prayer, silent prayer, Jesus prayer, all this, no, the prayer of the heart. It's a moment where this dimension sinks in, sinks in, okay? Now, of course, uh, we can talk a lot more about it, and I invite you to dive into the last parts, especially, of the book. Why? <coughs> because, as I said the other day, Therese leads us to Mary, leads us to Our Lady. The heart of the church, I dare to say, is Mary herself. The heart of the church, being the bride, Jesus' bride, is Mary herself. That furnace of love that we are supposed to dwell in is the quality of the love functioning already in Mary. Now, another, this is a dimension. You find it in the book, it's explained. Another very important dimension, the connection I show in the book between two things, and this will be my conclusion, between the external liturgy and the internal liturgy. By liturgy, I, I, I take the most important part of our liturgy, which is the Mass. On the Mass, at the Mass, you have the priest who represents Jesus. The altar, who represents Jesus as well. The offering, the uh, bread and wine, who will become the body and blood of Jesus. You have the lifting power of the Holy Spirit and the prayer of the priest, the Jesus praying. Uh, when the priest elevates, in the end of the Eucharistic prayer, he says, 
uh, in him, with him, in him, to you, uh, God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor. This is prayer. This is everything. So I explain from a text that Therese shows after the one I quoted, where she says, all the saints experienced and knew the secret of prayer. And the secret of prayer, they obtained it because they haven't asked for a material request like Archimedes. Archimedes asked, how can I lift the entire world? Translated, how can I save the entire world? God gave the old saints a fulcrum and a lever. The fulcrum, you lean on it. It has to be solid because it's sand. if it's sandy, you will, you will um, sink in. So it has to be solid. The, in the Mass, what is solid is the stone. Jesus is the cornerstone, is the stone, the altar. Because from the altar, then we'd be elevated. So the fulcrum here is God himself, Jesus. And the lever to elevate the lifting power is a, combi a combination of the priest who is Jesus, Jesus the priest, who, because the priest cannot live the entire world, no? He prayed for everybody, no? He, he consecrated, then he prayed for uh, the entire world, so introduced the entire world, the Pope, the bishops, the people, and every, all your children scattered around the world. We say it in the, in, the, in, the, in the Eucharistic prayer. Everybody is introduced in Jesus, then the priest takes Jesus, who is now carrying the entire world, and lifts him up. Nobody can do that. A normal priest cannot do that. Only Jesus the priest can do that. Do you follow me? Do you follow me? So, how, says Therese, can I lift the entire world, which is the action of the Mass, which is as well the action of the act of oblation. So, what you witness in the Mass is a reflection of what is happening and should be happening in your heart. You are a priest in Jesus. Jesus is in you. You are transformed in the fire of the Holy Spirit. So there is, you have the lifting power. So when you pray, and it's better if you take Mary's prayer, say the Hail Mary, what is happening? You are lifting the entire world. Which is totally in, 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 in harmony with all, all what we said before. So the exterior worship and the interior worship are one, united. You don't think that the priest is there and you, don't, you do nothing. No. The same liturgy, this, you have an altar in you. Jesus, you are baptized. You have a heart, which is the sacred place. You have an altar in it. You are a priest in Jesus. You are praying, draw me. Draw me, we, are, uh, we will run. We will run means you are a priest. Baptized, not baptismal priest, not, not the official priest, no? not the minister. Draw me means transform my prayer into the pure prayer, Mary's prayer, the fiery prayer, with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, you are lifting. So when you pray, or if you prefer, when you attend the Mass, remember that the Mass is ongoing in your heart. There is another Mass, smaller, at your dimension, but still huge. Universal, happening in your heart. We are not choosing between the Mass and our prayer. We are uniting ourselves to what is happening, the only uh, action that Jesus realizes and it uh, happens in the Mass. Do you, see, do you see how here all sorts of prayer becomes um, 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 uh, when you when you mold uh, molten uh, different metals and uh, put them together, Unified. what is the word? No, the the, the, the technical word. Mel. Weld. Weld. Yeah, it, everything is welded. 
your prayer, your missionary work, the Mass, your own prayer, your friends, your brothers and sisters, it's all brought in one. This is why, hence the subtitle, Trinity, Altar, Fire and Offering. It's all, everything is brought there. This is why Therese says, she dares to say, all the saints understood that, which means it's necessary. All of us, future saints, saints, are supposed to get that. It's not, it's not uh, optional. Okay? So, unfortunately, I have to stop here. Let us thank the Lord. Um, of course, I would enjoy uh, maybe next year or whatever, whatever uh, to give maybe an entire course on the Ark of Oblation. Uh, I don't have that leisure right now, but at least we had these uh, four hours. If you missed last uh, Wednesday, remember you have it online. Uh, just go on YouTube, put my name and you will and check, enter in the channel and then pick the last um, you will see it is toward the last uh, videos. Uh, it will have the same title, one of four, two of four, and then today is three of four and four of four. Okay. Um, let us thank the Lord with all our heart for having sent us uh, a small Our Lady, a small Mary, a person who is uh, really true, truthful, and true throughout and therefore is leading us to the, 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 this act of pure love which is the act that uh, all the acts that Mary Our Lady uh, made. Thank you Lord for this unique grace for St. Therese for the act of oblation how you inspired her how you showed her who you are and how you want to be loved in spirit and in truth, we are deeply rooted uh, in the Gospel, deeply rooted in St. Paul, deeply rooted in St. Luke. Give us, O oh Lord, the grace, graciously, the grace to be faithful to, to this, the true prayer, Mary's prayer, Mary's fiery prayer that Therese embodied. Teach us, O oh Lord, how to accept and love our weakness and cherish it and accept to remain like that, providing, of course, we put everything all the time in your heart, all our weaknesses, whatever we think is good in us, whatever we think we have achieved, just to put it in your heart, in your hands, in the fire of your love, because without the fire of your love, it doesn't have enough price, enough uh, efficiency. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who transgress against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil amen glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit was well, beginning now and ever shall be world without end amen uh, please remember to if you can of course i'm not forcing you i'm, I'm inviting you to read the book and as well think of your brothers and sisters if you want to offer this book uh, you can find it online on Amazon very easily the same price uh, it's reasonable price I did it on purpose I think even the United States is even cheaper uh, on purpose because the goal is not it, it's to read the book I want you to read and meditate and the book needs to be read more than once please remember that to read it more than once because people are hit by certain aspects in the beginning but they need to reach the end of it and be hit by all the chapters not only by one or two chapters so please remember that every time you read it again you will see something I myself look I am in that world from I don't know 83 85 and I'm still discovering every day something new. Every day I see something that I haven't seen before. So imagine, imagine. Okay? 
Thank you very much for your patience and see you next time.